Hello everyone, my name is Aaron Dolan and I'd like to welcome you to the first experiments. This is a series of short videos designed to get you started as quickly as possible. We'll breadboard working examples, provide a brief explanation of the theory. Generally, we'll provide enough information to get you started. You can build real world circuits today so that you can explore that theory in practice. Today's topic is the common base transistor amplifier. We'll introduce the circuit, provide a brief explanation of the DC bias considerations, explore the performance using a signal generator and an oscilloscope, and then we'll explore some of the next steps you might like to take to learn more about this particular topic. In a moment, we'll use this digital analog discovery as a function generator, and then view the results using an analog oscilloscope. I suppose we could have used the analog discovery to provide both DC power and to operate as the oscilloscope. However, I'd like to run at slightly higher voltages than this device is capable of. Here's a close-up of the circuit. The positive voltage rail is here. The negative voltage rail is here. And this rail is ground. This is the input from the signal generator. You can see that that goes through a resistor, a jumper, a capacitor, another jumper before arriving at the emitter of the transistor. So this is the emitter. The base of that transistor, you can see right here, is connected to ground. And the collector goes to the positive rail. And then we have another capacitor. And finally going to this load resistor. Here's a schematic for the circuit. You'll notice that the base is once again grounded. I suppose you could call this a grounded base amplifier, or you could call it a common base. The input is on the emitter, right? so the signal comes in here, and the signal leaves on the collector. Here is a 22 volt power supply and a negative 12 volt power supply. In a moment, we'll explore why those particular voltages were chosen. Capacitively coupled input, capacitively coupled output, with R4 being the load. The signal generator is that digital and analog discovery. And one of the first things you'll notice is that there's a 1K ohm resistor in series. That's done because this amplifier, this common base amplifier, is incredibly difficult to drive. In fact, I don't believe the analog discovery is capable of driving it directly. Let me explain. You know from your earlier studies of transistors that there is approximately 0.6 volts from the emitter to the base. And that's generally been described as a fixed, unchangeable voltage. Well, that can't be entirely true, because if you look at this schematic, you'll see the input is on the emitter. And if there is to be any voltage developed at this point, it must be pushing and pulling against that, what we typically call 0.6 volts. Now, we won't explore it today, but perhaps in a future video, we will refine our model of the transistor to include a tiny little resistance in that emitter circuit. For this amplifier and the way it's set up, that resistance is approximately 5 ohms. That's not something this signal generator can work against. So we have that 1k ohm current limiting resistor. That also allows us to do an experiment to empirically figure out what that input resistance is, or impedance if you prefer. As far as the design is concerned, here's how I started. I chose a 5 milliamp current to be flowing in this path. I then chose this 2.2k ohm resistor, selected the power supply, and then chose for there to be 11 volts DC on the collector. And that should work out because the current is equal to 11 divided by 2.2k which should give us 5 milliamps. This is a grounded base amplifier, which means the voltage right here on the emitter would be negative 0.7. 
because of that emitter to base voltage drop. Now, you remember that there is a tiny resistor here in the emitter circuit, which is on the order of five ohms. That relates back to R3 with the understanding that we'll pick an R3 that's approximately 10 times larger. So as long as R3 is 50 ohms or greater, we're good. For convenience, I simply chose another 2.2 K ohm resistor. Ignoring our base current, we know there's approximately five milliamps flowing here, which means 11 volts dropped across this resistor, to which we add this 0 0.7, which is approximately negative 12 volts which is close enough for our first experiments. Although when I do DC test the amplifier, I found that it's very close to 11 volts on the collector. Let's go ahead and test the amplifier. And then we'll come back and we'll talk a little bit more about the input impedance. What we're gonna do is we'll connect a probe up here. We'll call that channel one and we'll connect a probe out here, and we'll call that channel two. At some point, I will also move that probe to this point. And so I'll move channel one back to here, and we'll see that the voltage at the emitter is going to be very low. Due to the fact that we're trying to drive this low resistance in the emitter. This is the output of that signal generator, which of course is the input to the amplifier before that one K ohm resistor. And you can see that we have two volts peak. Here's the output of our amplifier. And you can see that the output is approximately 1.5 volts peak, which means we haven't actually amplified anything. We've actually attenuated the signal. However, let's move channel one which is the input probe to the actual emitter of the amplifier, because that's the point that we're interested in as far as amplification is concerned. We can see that the signal is there, although it's fuzzy because it's at the absolute limit of this oscilloscope. If I move it down slightly, let's go ahead and call that a 20 millivolt peak to peak, or we'll call it simply 10 millivolts peak. As far as the gain calculations are concerned, we take that 1.5 volts peak and then we divide it by 0 0.01, which gives us a gain of approximately 150. Okay, so that was 2 volts peak from the signal generator. 10 millivolts peak at the emitter and then 1.5 volts peak at the output. And we said that gain is equal to V out over V in, which in this case is 1.5 divided by, right, this 1.5 here, divided by this 10 millivolts which gives us a gain of 150. Once again, that's looking at the input on the emitter to the output. It's worth noting that this common base amplifier is incredibly difficult to drive. In fact, we can use the voltage divider rule to find out just how difficult it is. So if we were looking here if we were to look into this amplifier, what would we see? Well, it goes something like this. 0 0.01 is equal to x over 1k plus x all multiplied by 2. You may recognize that as the voltage divider. It basically says if we have 2 volts in and we get this 10 millivolts peak out, well, what is the ratio of these two resistors? What we're really trying to measure is what is this resistance right here? What is that little resistor in the emitter circuit? 
So 10 plus 0.01x is equal to 2x, which is pretty close to 5 ohms. If we're looking in and we see 5 ohms, we can state that R3 is quite irrelevant because this little resistor, this RE in the emitter, so RE is much less than R3, which is the emitter resistor. In summary, this is a hard amplifier to drive. You're not likely to find it on its own, except perhaps in some radio frequency applications. If you'd like to learn more, you should study up on something known as Miller capacitance. Perhaps in another video, we can explore how to calculate the input and output impedance. For example, empirically, we determine that the input impedance is about 5 ohms. Well, there's a way to do that with math. You may want to learn about cascode, not cascade, a cascode amplifier, where you find a common base amplifier is driven by a common emitter amplifier, which has a lot to do with this Miller capacitance I mentioned. And finally, you might want to learn about the differential amplifier, which is used on the front end of operational amplifiers. That's all for now. Please leave any comments, questions, or concerns in the space below.